Then I'm going to ask you guys again, are there any questions? Far away that, I'm sure there's a lot to cover. Can I get a pen just so I can... Um, so we're touching very closely on it, so I thought I'd uh, address it directly um, on content marketing and, and funding. Um, what do you think about America's Army, which is the game that the American Army funds and has going, where you play as a recruit and train to be a soldier? How does that? I think that's the only one I'm okay with, because it's called America's Army, and it's a recruiting game. My problem is all the other ones, that it does not label recruiting game for America's Army. I second that. <laughs> yeah, I would agree, and um, I mean, they tell you what it is, <laughs> and it is what it is. Um, well, I think you want to reply as well, or do you know? Uh, well, uh, I think it was the first uh, game to be so explicit in, in its message. And I don't think it's, it, it's uh, well, as long as, as, as uh, the creators are and kind of are uh, open about their intentions. It's it's just well, if if the uh, American, if the U.S. Army is allowed to put uh, up uh, the posters, why not uh, again uh, about the experience? Although it is all of course heavily sanitized uh, experience. Um, on second thoughts, actually, there is a problematic aspect with it because you don't have a control who actually downloads and uses it. And um, recruitment does not only happen through content marketing, uh, but it also happens in player circles, um, in interaction on social networks and social media. And so instead of having one recruiter standing at a sh at the shopping mall in the poorest area of town, you have um, one person just mapping um, the network of players playing, and then finding out who plays and who can be sent a, um, a message in the right moment of their development. So that is kind of problematic because it it's difficult to maintain a barrier um, for um, influence and when that influence starts. I just have a quick comment that if there happen to be any pacifist game designers and programmers in the room, maybe you could fly to America's Army and introduce some, introduce some bugs and shitty gameplay. <laughs> that, that would be very helpful. It's already pretty <laughs> All right. Man who perhaps ran a comb through hair sometime this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we seem to be on the precipice of uh, uh, VR, VR, virtual reality, being a major force in uh, the games industry. So I'm wondering what you all think, uh, how it will affect like uh, war in games, and maybe how it should affect war in games. So. I, I always have a comment, I just try to give someone else a chance to say something. Well, um, uh, to be fair, I have been waiting for VR since like 92, and it's always like just, just tomorrow we're going to get it. Tomorrow, next next game. Um, <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm very interested to see how, how this translates. This, this, this uh, sort of sensation of games, this um, this disconnect that we can make, is that, will that be as easy in these, uh, in a virtual reality game? Uh, will that hold the same kind of, um, will, will it be just as easy? Or will we maybe need to design games in even a more simplistic ways to still be able to enjoy this as, a, as an escapism where it's okay to kill people because it's fun? Um, from my point of view, uh, the arrival of virtual reality understood as in the modern terms, not future terms, which means that you have the stereoscopic vision uh, and when you turn your head you uh, actually uh, see the things that would be uh, to decide. And there are systems that allow this uh, today and uh, they will be uh, available to the consumers uh, very soon. And they won't change a thing. It's just a, a bit more realistic experience from the uh, graphical point of view. But it, uh, you know, uh, this is a, some kind of curve that starts from the blocky four color graphics, uh, from the uh, Hercules and CGA, uh, and uh, advances upwards uh, towards the modern times, but there's not 
this is not a, um, a revolution. No, 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 there is no uh, really uh, uh, paradigm shift or anything. So uh, games and war games also will become a, a more uh, realistic experience, but it won't bring us very much closer to the uh, possibility of experiencing what uh, war really is, because because uh, it's I don't think it's about the graphics. I'm excited <laughs> as a gamer, but I wouldn't put my money there. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to see how technology is going to take gaming. I mean, even either it's a war game or whatever. But the point is that war is terrible. So the minute it gets too realistic as a game, nobody's going to want to buy it. We want to play it. I mean, the minute you you it starts hurting you because there's no health packs in in, in war. Uh, if you blow your foot off, you know it's gonna hurt and it's probably gonna kill you. And uh, you know, virtual reality will only take you to you know uh, a limit where, as you say, graphics and you know experience, maybe even smell sometime in the future. But I mean, war also smells really bad, and you know, it's a lot of dirt and grass sweat and i've seen these machines making you know virtual reality you can walk around it everybody who's played paintball knows how exhausting it is to to run around and i mean i've been doing the running around in winter time in snow you know in finmark with with you know a huge package of you know 30 kilos uh, a wet tent and you have your gun there and it's constantly full of snow and you know you're puking because you're so tired it's not gonna you know, be very fun to play that game <laughs> um, I have to ask the question though um, why do you always assume that games have to be easily consumable entertainment to become both successful and engaging. And I think this War of Mine has shown, the commercial success of this War of Mine has shown, that you actually can make a gritty game which causes very difficult experiences and people want to play it. Because they want to see, they want to experience something if you play. And this is, I think, the distinction between shallow entertainment and art. And I would say that most AAA titles are shallow entertainment, while this War of Mine approaches something that is art that challenges us and won't leave us alone. And um, by this process, which we was usually reserved for really good literature, um, can also be approached in a game form, I think, as it can in film. Uh, but we have to try, we have to be uh, courageous, um, both financially and um, yeah, well, culturally, uh, but I think it can be done. So I think the time has come to Grace Wetterman. <laughs> All right. Hello? Okay. Mm. So I have, I think I have two questions for you. Uh, half of the panel seems to believe that um, that uh, these first person shooter games mostly, well, they they would make gamer, gamers more pro-war, at least make the gamers think more lightly about war. And I was wondering if you had some polls, and if you know about any polls that says that maybe well gamers are more pro-war or gamers do think more lightly about war and secondly uh, I would like to know what a good what a good first minute shooter to play a game looks like because today they're pretty grounded and I'll, I'll, I'll give that as a game genre they're probably the least interesting of all the game channels out there, but still, what does a good one look like to you? Can I start? Okay. Um, <clears throat> we believe that gamers are more pro-war. Um, I think I never said that, because I tried to get beyond the idea that um, discursive and cultural influence only happens through gamers. I think it's more about the iconography of the whole society and the whole culture, which um, creates a pro-war effect. However, if you want to go to gamers, um, of course, when uh, the American military uses millions to finance something, 
they want to know how it works. So there's pretty good statistic available about the effects of America's army on gamers, for instance. And they have um, measured a significant rise in uh, the um, nah, that they want to serve in the army, um, a more positive uh, picture of the US military, and blah, 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 blah. However, you have to treat those studies, of course, with a kind of a, well, uh, a cautioning idea back in your head, because, of course, those who made the game have an interest in presenting the, the results they want to get more funding. So you have that organizational thing in the background. Um, first person shooter. Can I include a third person shooter, please? OK, thank you. Because I think Spec Ops The Line does a great job in creating a, an unbelievably powerful narrative that precisely comments on established generic game mechanics. It really uses a very good narrative to comment upon what are we led to do here and how does it happen and, 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 and what's happening here. And, um, just play this game so you know how very good third person shooter might look like, world based, and then you can extrapolate this to a possible first person shooter. That's, I think that's probably one of the categories. And uh, of course, we have uh, the same idea. It's not, it's not necessarily about making gamers more pro-war, uh, but it would be the equivalent of if you spend most of your days gaming and your that your genre and the kind of games you like are then set within a, a, a fictional world where you know war is okay. That is that is going to have effect on a culture as a whole. Just like if I spent every day going home and watching movies that were pro-war. Well, obviously, in the, in in in, war, in, um, uh, in within movies and TV shows, we have a much more nuanced and much more sort of oppositional voices. But if I only sat down and watched like kind of propaganda esque movies about war, I would have to be a very very unique and special individual to be able to resist all those messages. Not just like war is good, but maybe like how to do masculinity. What does it mean to be a real man? What does it mean to be protective? What, who are real victims? Who are fragile? Uh, what is useful? What is not useful? I think you did it really well with this, our instinct to think that in war, a weapon is the most valuable thing. I have been trained by this, by years of years of killing zombies in games, on tabletop, and reading books, and watching TV. I know weapons is the key. But no, that, that is evaluating it. Sort of, something that's happened, even though I feel I am a very critical and an informed, Gamer, everyone feels they are a critical and informed gamer, obviously. We all do. But these messages will still go in, they will still be a part of me. So I, I still think we need some other stories. Uh, personally, I think first person shooters can be a lot of fun. I just, I just think that maybe if we allow them to be other, if they just allow them to be first person, uh, first something shooters, they might be more fun. If it wasn't always people killing other people with guns that look like the ones that we have in the shop. But the genre is being limited by the idea that they need to be look be visually as close to reality as possible. And maybe we could do more interesting game mechanics if we try to make something else, something more fantastical, something more weird. Uh, I think that uh, uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, it's it's true that games as a whole uh, carry a kind of pro-war message because. They are about conflict, they are about uh, winning, and uh, uh, <clears throat> but we have to consider the roots from which they grew. Uh, each kind of art was at its roots, at its roots uh, solo entertainment. I, I'm speaking about the modern arts like cinema, uh, but was, uh, well, uh, even books started as stories told by the campfire uh, and uh, each, uh, each kind of art uh, outgrew uh, its uh, origins and evolved and uh, for every uh, all quiet on the western front there were many books published at the time which praised uh, the efforts of uh, valiant soldiers and uh, lamented the treachery of the enemy and so on, which were essentially war propaganda. And I hope, uh, well, we didn't create uh, this war of mine specifically to restore the balance, because uh, it would be a, a bit, um, uh, well, uh, too big a, 
a, a challenge uh, for uh, a single game. But I hope that there will be more games that uh, present the more full picture and that uh, doesn't... Uh, uh, well, actually, I hope and I see that change, uh, that uh, there are more games that uh, try to, to be something more uh, in every genre. Uh, uh, and that, that's that's uh, that's just the process of coming up for the for uh, this kind of art. I uh, I just got a thought here. Um, well, what's a good war game? I mean, would a good war game be you know putting in a lot of civilian? There are a lot of, you know, casualties of war, a lot of collateral damage. I don't know, you have Grand Theft Auto is that game. And I don't, I basically never liked Grand Theft Auto. I think it's, you know, pretty much a lousy game uh, when it comes to uh, every other aspect than actually driving the cool cars. Um, and I don't know if that's just the kind of the moral compass in me that I, I never enjoyed driving down people, you know, driving people down from the, the sidewalks and, and, you know, hitting people with a bat, etc. That's why I think I enjoy war games, because the roles are so, I mean, I am a soldier, that is my character, I'm in the war. It gives me, as you said, Holger, it gives me kind of a reason to, to shoot my enemy, but still, uh, it is a good reason, and, and I think also one aspect which is, is the time we live in. I mean, war today is a lot closer, especially in this country, in, in Norway, is a lot closer to us now than it has been since the Second World War. Uh, when I was a soldier in the, in the army and in, in Unifil and in, in Bosnia and in Kosovo, Norwegian soldiers had not, you know, really been pushed to killing for 50 years, I mean, since the Second World War. And, I mean, in Unifil, we were UN soldiers, I mean, um, I cannot, I don't think we killed anyone within, the, you know, the, the one and a half year I served in, in Lebanon, uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, I mean, the casualties uh, of war was minimum uh, compared to, you know, Second World War. But now you have a generation with soldiers and a reality with the Norwegian soldiers after Afghanistan, Iraq, etc., where you have to expect that actually the ma majority of soldiers who's been, serve who's been serving in Afghanistan has participated in, you know, real combat like you see in the games and, and actually been forced to, to kill their enemies. And, um, and that's reality, and that has, you know, uh, something which, for example, the US, which big part of the gaming industry comes from, uh, they have generations from Vietnam, from, from before that you have uh, 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 Korea, you have Vietnam, you have several different, everybody has a father or an uncle or a brother who served. Uh, which makes kind of the, the impact of the game, I think, less than the impact of the, your surrounding your, uh, environment. I mean, war is a much more uh, part of the identity of the U.S., the identity of your family, the identity of being an American, etc., uh, which kind of, kind of makes it more alien in Norway, but still we're in a generation where it actually isn't anymore. Uh, I'm a, even though I'm only 41, I'm now an old guy who's viewing this from my generation, while the young generation, younger generation, actually has experienced a lot more of war, intense and closer up than I have. So, I think we're going to go to orange person. Who's <laughs> what? Stop. Oh yes, you're not you're not orange skin. That was not my intention. Oh, that's good. okay. I might be orange. Who knows? But I'm not from sunny or anything like that. Um, my question, if I can remember it correctly, was about um, you asked, is it all right for gaming to be games to be based around war? And you've talked we've talked about that a lot. 
And I want to say that games have, as long as human beings have been interacting with each other and making any kind of game, there have been war games. Checkers is a war game. Mojong is a war game. Chess is a war game. Stratego is a war game. You have uh, Risk, which my kid always gets really upset about because she loses. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, I just thought, could it be not the fact that we have war games, but that as a whole, from what I've seen, society and humans have not been able to embrace the idea that games are differentiated just as films are. You're not going to send your 10-year-old to watch Saving Private Ryan. Or, oh, well, I wouldn't know. Or, uh, and you're not going to, you know, have the violent sex scenes in some movie that you're going to show to a, a kid who's 12 or 13. But people still buy video games. GTA 5, I have a nephew who's 8, and he goes to his buddy's house and plays GTA 5. I told his parents this is not okay. But still the parents don't quite grasp it because it's a game. Do we have an issue with calling this games? Because a lot of people who don't play games have a different definition in their mind of what a game would be than those of us who do. Even my husband, who lived, we've been married for 32 years and he has no, he still has very little concept of the depth of concentration one needs when you're playing a video game. When you're playing a game, you can't just drop it and answer the question about tomorrow's dinner. It, it's really hard. You know? And I think that the parents also have this trouble. So it's trouble when they're interacting with their children and they ask them to, you know, just log off and go to your, your tours or whatever. Um, how can we address this? And is, is this even relevant? I'm going on and on. Also, you're totally right about the war culture. I've just come back from America. You hear I'm American. But I've, I've lived in Norway most of my life, but I had to go for stop oil with my husband and live in America for two years. And I, I entertained myself by being a substitute teacher. And I am shocked at the number of boys who have opened up to me and say, when, as soon as I'm 18, I'm joining the Marine, Marines. As soon, as soon as I'm 18, I'm joining the Army. I'm going to be... It's, it's just a mind-blowing thing. But yeah, that's American. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, we'll just take the last question at the same time and then we'll wrap up. Or should we uh, one more round of, or we don't have time for one more round. All right. Okay. Then, so we have the, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, she essentially stole my question, but I'll follow up with, uh, I'll follow up with, uh, so typically you have the Western gaming development uh, culture and, and then Eastern in Japan and Korea mainly. Uh, how would you say that those two two cultures of game development address war in games differently? And, and the same, I suppose. Right, so both those questions, I guess, at the same time. I think we. I, I like to pick up the first. Yeah, we're gonna. We maybe we should let them reply before we. I'll promise I'll be really quick. Yeah. Uh, it's about having sort of, um, yes, we have an issue in society where we tend to treat games as something else and a lot of common sense seems to fall out. Like, you shouldn't, if, if it's rated 18, don't, don't let eight-year-olds play it. It's simple. Uh, and I think there is a lot of good initiatives. Uh, maybe to see have working very hard to make parents understand the importance of this. My other comment is that, while we have to keep in mind the, the long history of games and war, the interrelation, we cannot pretend that Czech is, is the same as Medal of Honor. We cannot pretend that, that the, the, this, level of, uh, this level of graphic reality and what kind of symbols are put in there makes these something that we can put, sort of, say that they are the same thing. Uh, and then, and personally, I wish we had more people thinking from, you know, checkers or chess when they say, I want to design a war game. That, uh, that, that uh, games as a genre, games as a medium, is being held back by our a need to think that things shouldn't be abstract. That we need to look back to the roots of digital games. All genres of games were invented like in 1987. Since then we've added better graphics and saving points. So we really need to, to look back if we want to find different ways of expressing this. 
And it's not surprising that um, war games and war stories are as old as humanity because war is the most well, uh, extreme collective endeavor we can engage in. Um, uh, however, um, the idea then that there is a relation between the actual experience and the popular cultural expressions um, that has to be kind of qualified because very often war games or war films are advertised with the idea that, oh, the soldier said it's just like it was on the battlefield, for instance. And there have been done interesting studies by, for instance, Marita Sturkin, who was kind of surprised that kind of that popular cultural thing like Saving Private Ryan should get a veteran to say, oh, it was just like that. And um, she then found out that it works rather the other way around. Those people go in to watch a movie, and then the imagery of the movie influences what they believe they memorize or commemorate of their own war experience. Um, so there are series of different ways how these things interact. I guess. And then um, the idea about, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you said that um, you brought up the sex thing, and I still find it really peculiar that you have greater difficulties getting a pair of boobs on screen um, than blowing someone's head off or something. I, I don't know the difference between sort of the, the Asian game industry and the Western game industry and, and war, but I'd really like to know more if anyone has a perspective, maybe you do. I, I want to know more. Please, please inform. But, uh, we're speaking about the Eastern game industry. Do you mean the Eastern European or Asian? Uh, so, I, I realize that my stereotypical view was very uh, rough. Uh, obviously, you have more than just two distinct cultures, but just to do briefly, I meant Asian culture Asian. and Western culture. So, uh, I don't think any one of us is, uh, uh, well, all, all of us obviously have a, a extensive knowledge of, of, of games, but uh, uh, no one of us has uh, personal experience working for the uh, Asian games industry, and I think that the, well, the, this is industry which is producing mostly, uh, uh, so to say, to, for the, uh, their own market. So that that would be explain the, some differences in the vulnera vulnerabilities and, and, and things. But but uh, well, I, I'm not really qualified to to, to answer that question. I would, I would just briefly say, point out some positive things. <laughs> um, I don't know about the Asian or, or European gaming industry, but uh, I mean, checkers is a, is a game of strategy. Uh, modern war games is more merging all these strategy games into uh, first-person shooter games into uh, the multiplayer aspect, where you actually you know one plays the medic. One plays the, the 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 dog handler. One plays the the backup shooter, etc. Making a, a team effort, and I mean, I think the research uh, I read about uh, World of Warcraft shows that these kind of uh, multiplayer games, where you actually have to work together as a team in order to to uh, solve the mission. <coughs> Also, give, it has a lot of positive, positive aspects uh, going into leadership training, teamwork training, um, how to be humble, uh, how to actually uh, not shoot every time, how to choose different paths, how to choose a different strategy, etc. So there's so so many positive things, which is interesting to test through a war game which I think gives the positive value also, which uh, often in these discussions are missed out because we're uh, so into the moral of showing war. And I mean, I've, I've been a peacekeeper. I mean, would it be better if a game, if you had a blue helmet and you were, you know, uh, making peace? Uh, would it then be worse if the adversary was a, a child so soldier, etc.? I mean, you have so many aspects, moral <coughs> aspects, which I think we could test. I mean, you have done this with this game, which is brilliant. Uh, I, I found it brilliant because I thought it was going to be really boring because the first game like this was, I think, a UN food mission game. Uh, they had online, uh, you know, like 10 years ago and you had to drop uh, some, you know, food and all. This ended up 
destroying the village <laughs> because all my food ended up and destroyed the huts. Anyway, this is you know something which gives you an, uh, choices. Uh, like you said, uh, war ends when people go home. For most gamers, you are already home, so you can end it when you don't want it anymore. But this one kept me going, and you said, you know, what you choose. I knew choose food all the time. I mean, that's the, what you pri prioritize. But uh, you can see, you know, this is a real challenge for people who think that war is about guns. I think blue sweater person or hoodie person. I actually had a, have a question for the uh, developer of uh, this war of mine uh, from the previous uh, thing we were talking about, which is are you afraid that your people actually are going to enjoy and have fun with your game? <laughs> uh, could you repeat? Are you are you afraid that people are actually gonna enjoy and have fun with your game? Because uh, because you were you were a bit uh, afraid to uh, say that people might enjoy your game. Yeah, uh, am I afraid of yes. people actually enjoying the game? Well, uh, no, uh, no. I, I mean, uh, uh, first, uh, there is uh, actually some enjoyment to be found. Uh, in this war of mine, uh, because despite uh, uh, the bleakness of the setting, uh, the desperation that uh, sets in, uh, every success uh, has a uh, tremendous weight. It, it, it's not just another achievement or another point scored, it's, it's another day when uh, our people uh, don't uh, have to go to sleep hungry. So, uh, all successes are really uh, satisfying, I would say. Uh, and, well, uh, secondly, uh, it is a game, uh, and if uh, people derive uh, uh, some entertainment value from observing the lives of, of fictional characters struggling with uh, in a war zone, uh, well, who am I to judge? Uh, I think I think that uh, 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 what we want to, to uh, what is the best outcome for us is if uh, some people uh, uh, if we can get some people to think and uh, and we know from the comments we are getting from uh, all over the world that this game works that way it it, it, it challenges uh, uh, a lot of uh, things that people uh, are taking for granted. So, uh, I don't have a problem with uh, some players uh, just uh, just uh, uh, taking uh, <coughs> treating it as entertainment. And uh, well, even playing as as uh, soulless monsters who who uh, try to uh, survive by robbing uh, everyone, everyone blind. And uh, it is possible to play like that. You will probably lose some characters to suicide, but there are certain, uh, certain characters in the game who are quite unconcerned with, with uh, others. Because there are some people who prioritize uh, uh, their own survival. Uh, well, most people do, but, but you know, who, who are less, less um, uh, traumatized by the suffering of others, less uh, em emphatic. I, I just like to say something, because I think it's really important what you said about uh, parents not knowing enough about games and letting kids play war games. But I also think, I actually agree with you, I think there's so many new games today uh, when it comes to art. There's so many new games that don't involve war, and there's a huge difference between the games that are being developed in the West and the games that are being developed in Japan, for example. In Japan, you can play, uh, for example, you can learn how to cook, you can maybe be a doctor, you play RPG games, uh, a lot of them. And um, uh, you can play, for example, a game I was playing even yesterday, which was Flower, where you just a paddle that goes to uh, a garden, and you have to find other flowers and just collect all the flowers. and this is a, 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 a base that is in the city. Uh, there's so many new games uh, today, and, and gamers are, are so, there's so many gamers that play so many different things, not just the, uh, the, uh, the war games or, or this or that game. There's games for everyone. 
And uh, for the soldier, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, on GTA, they give you the option to kill people. You don't have to kill anyone. I think this is so important. You don't have to kill anyone. You can just do the objectives of the game without having to kill someone that is on the middle of the street. That's your option. It's something that you can do. Maybe you think, you think it's funny, maybe you don't think it's funny. The games give you options. They give you uh, uh, ideas that you, something that you can do. And I, I'm very happy. I, I don't like GTA, but it's not my favorite game. But I was very happy to play GTA and just, you know, like, yeah, maybe. Maybe I'll just kill now five people. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and that's what I love about games giving you the challenge of taking choices, like uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, I think, the first scene there, uh, the, the airport the massacre. I think a lot of people pointed the gun somewhere else and just, you know, played on, but they didn't kill anybody. I, I you know, because you can go through that scene without killing anybody, but you have to you kind of discharge your gun somewhere and play along with the terrorists. And uh, that game also had a lot of moral choices, uh, and it doesn't really portray war as a very nice thing. You had a Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl, uh, uh, whole Chernobyl scenery, which is beautifully made. I mean, that's a piece of art when it comes to making a, a good uh, war game. Uh, but it's not, you know, really glorifying war at all. And I think you see more and more of this in modern war games as well. It's not black and white, and it forces you to take choices, and that's what I think makes games fun to play. Um, so basically, I mean, there's no black and white. I think we need to end. On I just that have problem. to. I just have to make that point because, right. of course, yes. games are about making choices, and that's what makes them fun. But I think Modern Warfare is a very bad example for this. Especially, I mean, the first mission of that Modern Warfare too. And it's a great choice that you don't have to shoot civilians. I mean, what kind of choice is that? Um, on the other hand, um, also here you have a moral disengagement factor. Because that you are there at all is just because you believe you can prevent an even greater atrocity by actually walking along. So also, I already in that scene, even though it has been kind of celebrated as the great advance of the first-person shooter, um, is kind of narrowly framed and thereby takes away the choice, really. So. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, it seems we have solved war games. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, and the next time we will be solving education in games. Now, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. And if anyone is feeling inspired by anything we've said or done here today, you can feel free to submit a text to the uh, Digital Lives uh, Writing Contest. Uh, Hosted by Jay Wood. So uh, thank you again for coming, and hope to see you soon in March.